Well, good evening to you from our studios here in Texas. Those of you who were expecting Dr. Jones this evening, um, I hope you won't be disappointed. Uh, you have me instead. So that means that the teaching will be significantly different, but hopefully not disappointing. Um, I must say I've been enjoying uh, listening to um, Bob Graves. Uh, he had some wonderful things to say, and I actually always enjoy listening to him. And just kind of helps me uh, just add food for thought and uh, gives me uh, a little more to share, which is really basically what I want to do this evening. Won't be so much a teaching as it will be, uh, you might just say, a sharing of experience. And... Uh, as I was thinking about the things I wanted to say this evening, which, by the way, basically I want to talk about uh, the Spirit of God, which uh, has been of interest to me for quite some time now, many years. But uh, it's the more recent years that I've learned exactly what is meant by that statement. And when we refer to the Spirit of God... Uh, I've come to understand that what it means is the expression of God. And so if, uh, according to what we read, the words of Paul, when he spoke and stated, uh, or actually commanded uh, to the church at Galatia to walk in the Spirit, uh, he was actually stating, walk in the expression of God. Now, this was something that in times past... Uh, was very difficult because men in their understanding of God really didn't know God. And uh, the the thing is, this becomes a quite important issue. And uh, tonight I want to kind of deal with it in, the, uh, in association with the term inheritance. Uh, that uh, is a word that is, was stressed by the Apostle Paul quite a bit. He used that term uh, several different occasions. And uh, there is something for us in the way of inheritance. And uh, <laughs> there's another term that's going to become quite important, and that is the term us. But uh, I'll get back to this in just a moment. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, share some words that uh, aren't exactly mine. But uh, these this was something that I had uh, thought about starting off with tonight. And after listening to Bob, I decided I want to go ahead and start off with these words because there was um, a comment that came in uh, to Bob and uh, it had to do with corrupt man, the, the term corrupt man. And that's uh something that I think a lot of people struggle with, and I'll have to admit uh, I struggled with it for a long time. And when I say struggle, what I mean by that is uh, thinking that that's a reality, that God actually created us, and somehow or another we became totally depraved. Either He created us that way, or we managed to get ourselves that way somewhere or another. But... Um, uh, more and more, it's becoming apparent that this is a fallacy. This is just not true. Uh, and actually, when we consider that God created us in in His image, uh, I think we possibly need to be careful what we say because we may actually be uh, insulting God. And that's something I, that's a place I don't think we need to go. But <laughs> one thing I think we can take comfort in is uh, the fact that God is not really thin-skinned. Uh, <laughs> it may be a poor analogy, but uh, it's what comes to mind because I think a lot of times we act as if He's just that way, that we have to walk on eggshells around Him. And if we say the wrong thing, uh, He gets really upset and uh, no telling what He might do to us. Well, I just want us to consider these few words before I go any farther. And these are actually uh, the words of Jesus as, as we have them translated, at least, in uh, Matthew chapter 10. And uh, he, he makes a really a very powerful statement. And uh, 
I don't know that we can get the gravity of this statement, but maybe we can get the beauty of it, at least. Um, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? What? Let me take just a moment here, because I don't want to misread this. It's kind of bad when you have giant print and you still can't see it. But that's why they make these, so <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of them. Much better. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. <laughs> I wonder if we really get that. I mean, the question is, did Jesus really say that? Or at least something like that. And if he did, what could he have meant by it? Now, he's, he's making reference to the Father. And uh, up until this time, uh, man just didn't recognize God as a father figure. And especially one who, uh, like he really is. And uh, this is what Jesus is indicating uh, to us here, what kind of father he actually is. And uh, he's one who apparently cares about his creation quite dearly. And uh, I even take comfort in, in these words when uh, I, I see a sparrow fall, <laughs> so to speak. You know, uh, uh, obviously, uh, God is pleased with what he created, and he cares deeply about it. And according to what we just read, apparently... We human beings, to him, are worth much more. And uh, that's, that's actually what Jesus is emphasizing here. And to me, even as I think about it tonight, this is amazing. This is incredible. And um, mainly, mainly because of uh, what most have come to believe, what most are being taught today. And uh, let's get back to the issue of a, a thin-skinned God and... Uh, one who uh, is, is a lot of things, and I'd rather not go into detail about so much as about what he's not, but what and who he really is. Because um, there's, a, there's a particular term, and I won't uh, attempt to try to deal with it to any degree other than just to bring up the term, because it's one that, uh, that is quite controversial, and it's the term predestined or predetermined. And obviously there's something to uh, this idea because uh, we find it a, a couple of different times in the teachings of Paul that God actually predetermined something uh, before time began, uh, before he actually created things. This, this term is brought up more than once. And uh, it has caused uh, divisions, uh, <clears throat> not necessarily the term itself, but the way that people have uh, used the term or, or misused it, possibly, I would say most likely. But uh, if we associate it with certain words uh, uh, that we find in the book of Romans, for example, Romans chapter 8, uh, it, talks about, it talks about God's foreknowledge. And those that he foreknew, he actually predetermined something. And what he predetermined was that we be conformed conform to his image. In other words, to become like him. And uh, this gets back to the issue of the expression of God. Now, if Paul could tell a group of people that they needed to walk in the Spirit, that is to walk in with his expression, then it only stands to reason that they would need to know what he's like. And uh, if this is something, in fact, that, that we should do, then we should know what he's like. We, we would need to know that. And um, for some reason or another, this seems to be an issue that uh, even though maybe to some degree people talk about it or, or try to uh, come to terms with it, 
it's something that obviously is very much ignored at the same time because, um, for example, uh, we know that uh, the Scripture says that uh, God is love. John stated that. And uh, we find the Apostle Paul defining that love, describing uh, that love, and he even refers to it as, as the most excellent way, uh, that which will never fail. And uh, so if it makes sense, and of course this is, this is a major issue, the fact that it makes sense, uh, when you begin to really uh, research a lot of what uh, is being taught and what has been believed uh, and is being believed to this day, concerning God, concerning Christ, concerning the Bible, uh, some of the things that uh, Bob was dealing with uh, a few moments ago. Uh, much of what we've been taught, much of what we read, when you really look at it logically, just doesn't make sense. But when you uh, can recognize that which God says that He is, uh, that is love. Uh, it can identify his character. Uh, another case in point is uh, back uh, in in the, Paul's dealings with the Galatians. He actually gave lists of uh, first of all what uh, can be termed as the flesh or the sinful nature, and you have quite a long list there. But then when it comes to the fruit of the spirit, and and I love the way that it's expressed there because. Fruit is something that uh, comes into being on whatever tree uh, that uh, that fruit has been assigned to. <laughs> I mean, the tree grows and, and the fruit uh, just come as a result of uh, the nature of that particular tree. And so when we consider the fruit of the Spirit, it would be that which this fruit, uh, I mean, this uh, the Spirit that is the expression of God, the, actually the way he expresses himself. And so when we understand it that way, then we can look at this and knowing that this is something that he's actually predetermined, not just for some of us, but for all of us. Because um, quite clearly states that, uh, this, uh, that he is the God and Father of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. So this expression is actually in us. And I'm going to refer to some of Bob's words again. I really enjoyed the things that he had to say. And that is, although we may be, uh, uh, the my favorite one that he used was uh, spiritually retarded. <laughs> uh, it uh, may sound a little mean, I guess, but, you know, it's it's really not. If we're retarded, it's not necessarily something that we want to be or have intended to be, or it's just we've had things possibly hinder us. Uh, because obviously this is something that is not just there, uh, this expression that we're referring to. Because uh, let me go ahead and state the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, temperance, meekness, Faith. <laughs> and I, I love what uh, is, it, it, the follow-up there. It says, against such there is no law. Uh, where you have these character traits, you need no law because there's nothing uh, wrong. <laughs> there will be no wrong expression when this is the expression because this is actually the, the very essence, the very expression, the very character of God. And I did state earlier that uh, I would tie this in with the term inheritance, because um, for many years, uh, that was a confusing issue for me. Uh, and I think it is for a lot of folks. Uh, and to really put it in perspective, let me bring up an aspect of love, because when we look at the love of God and uh, what it is by definition. One of the things that we discover about it, and this is actually found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is that it's not self-seeking. 
Now, for some reason or another, this was something that I never really associated with God. I mean, it was as if when I read this term, even though knowing God is love and that that's his expression, I really never thought about him not being self-seeking because ever since I can remember, that's what was presented to me, that he was very self-seeking, very self-absorbed. Everything was all about him. And uh, to be quite honest, it's, it's kind of hard to get away from that notion. But uh, just a simple question of what we read, the words of Jesus, if it's all about him, then why does he care so much about us? Why would he go to so much trouble to show his love for us and to uh, express himself as being a father, as being our father? Now, I'll use myself as an example. What kind of father would I be if it was all about me and nothing about my children? And um, I might even say I have a little fruit of an example of that in my life because at one time it was, you know, I thought that way. I thought that way about God, that actually he was self-seeking and therefore I was self-seeking. It was about me. If I told my children something and they said, why? They weren't, uh, they weren't allowed to say that. It's because I said, I'm like, I'm God. <laughs> Well, thank God that he's not really that way. And thank God that I'm being more changed into his image <laughs> uh, to be less and less self-seeking. Um, but this, this is just one of the, the aspects that is, is so overlooked. Uh, and... Uh, Another, another that we really, really is ignored, that is is actually huge, is uh, the fact that he keeps no record of wrongs. And um, <laughs> I, I, I want to relate some of my own experience, uh, some that actually have amazed me because some of the things that I have actually believed most of my life, when when they came into question. Uh, have changed radically. And uh, I, I posed a question to my mom uh, one day, and I thought that uh, this might really, no telling what kind of response I might get, but I'm going to pose it here tonight. What kind of a father, and I'm actually referring to God, <laughs> would sacrifice himself to himself to satisfy himself concerning the wrongs that his children had done that he had no record of. And <laughs> actually my mom surprised me when I asked her that question by saying that never did make sense to me. And actually that was quite encouraging to me because when thought about that way, it really doesn't make sense. Now, for some, this might o open a can of worms because you say, well, if, if that's not the issue, and by the way, you know, that's what the term atonement, uh, propitiation, that's what it means. It means uh, satisfied. And that supposedly uh, this blood had to be shed in order for God to be satisfied concerning the wrongs that we'd done. And... It's as if that's not enough, because if we don't believe it, then it's still not, a, still not effective. And uh, so we add a work to it, and then we claim that uh, there are no works involved. So we, have a, we end up with a real mess. But to, to simplify that equation, it's just simply the fact that when, when Jesus came to us and actually showed us the expression of God, gave us the expression of God, this one who actually truly does keep no record of wrongs, who actually values that which he created. Um, he, he demonstrated this love that 
goes on to say that it is across the boards. It's unconditional. And uh, he qualified it by stating, love your enemies. He said, I say to you, you've heard it said this way, you know, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. And so when he shed his blood, actually, it was a demonstration of the very thing that he taught, the very thing that he expressed, a love for all. Actually, at that time, you, it, it would appear that he had no friends, no one who called him friend. But apparently he called us all his friends. He had already expressed our value as far as he was concerned, and he demonstrated it to the fullest. And he had even stated, no greater love has any man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, and that's what he did. And um, so if, if we can be encouraged tonight, uh, if we can be greatly encouraged, we can recognize our value to him. And um, I guess that's, that's mostly what I wanted to share tonight. But um, the, the question we get asked a lot because of the position that we take <laughs> I guess it does seem quite radical to a lot of people, uh, the fact that uh, we truly believe God is love. Uh, love keeps no record of wrongs. Therefore, uh, there's no wrongs to um, be atoned for. There's no wrongs to punish people eternally for. Now, it should go without saying that uh, he is a God of correction. Um but one point I, I didn't bring out that I did want to bring out is that uh, in the uh, listing, in the uh, identification of his character, we find nothing about anger. And uh, I will confess tonight that even that one, even when I state it, when I think about it, because of the baggage that I've carried most of my life, that one's still hard to uh, wrap my mind around. Uh, to the fact that he's never been angry, never will. Now, a lot of this that we call the Bible, that we refer to as inerrant, uh, does indicate, especially in the under the Old Covenant, that not only did he get angry, but he was angry most of the time, and that's why we had to walk on eggshells around him, because we never knew when he was going to get upset and do hideous things to us. How refreshing should it be for us to know that he's really not like that? He's never been that way. And this is the issue with him. Because, you know, people do ask us, well, if there's, if there's no hell, and my own brother asked me this, he said, so what you're saying, if there's no hell, then I can do anything I want to and still go to heaven. I said, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. There's no other place to go. And then I followed it up with a question. I said, so what is it that you want to do? Are you wanting to kill somebody? Are you wanting to steal? Are you wanting to do these things? And of course, if he, did, and he didn't, but <laughs> if he had said yes, I would have said, well, you've got problems. I mean, you, know, you need to get to know this God. It's wonderful. Uh, he's wonderful. And uh, to to walk in his character, in his expression, um, you know, I've, I've lived a, a number of years and uh, I can say the, the most joyful thing, the most enjoyable thing I've done in my life is to be able to express his character to someone. Because what it does is it takes the focus off of self and actually places it on someone else, just as he did that day that he spoke those words. And he, he wanted us to know, and he wants us to know tonight, that, um, that we're worth so much more than anything that he values greatly. And uh, gosh, like I said earlier, sometimes it's hard to fathom. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, 
I guess that's why Paul prayed the way he did. Uh, apparently, uh, we find in the book of Ephesians that uh, he, his prayer was that we might have the power to actually grasp how deep, how wide, how long, and how high his love is. And I think that that's the greatest struggle that we all have. But if we can all get there, then we will be able to express the same love toward one another. And it will change everything. And that's what I'm looking forward to. That's what uh, I plan to give my life to. Uh, what How many ever years I have back and or have left, I should say. And... Um, you know, I, I want to to do my part, and um, I want to close by bringing up one more statement that uh, uh, that or it actually, I guess I'd call it a statement anyway. Uh, something that Bob was referring to, and uh, it it really is an encouragement to me because uh, I know there are many that are so much more qualified in so many areas that I'm not. And I'm thankful for each and every one of them because, uh, you know, I, I can recognize our need for one another, my need for others. And uh, all I'm interested in is not trying to be like someone else or to do what they do or be able to say things the way they say it, but just to share that which has been given me and to do as much as I can with that which God has given me. And so hopefully tonight in some way you've been encouraged um, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to the things I have to say. And we hope to see you soon. Good night.